Well, good morning. Warm welcome to all of you. Glad that you could be with us here. Glad those of you who are online, glad you'd be with us as well. If you're a guest with us, we'd love to connect uh, with you. There's a connect card in front of you. Fill it out and put it in the offering. And online, a link's going to come up in a minute. We have so many great things happen. It's going to take two of us to do it this morning. And lots of great things happening here. So we start Palm Sunday. It's starting the beginning of, of Holy Week. So we've got Monday, Thursday, and, and Good Friday. Hope that you're with us on this journey. It's important each year that we observe those days. So Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, services are 12.30 and 6.30. They're here in the worship center. And both days, 6.30, will be live streamed. And then the Easter celebrations start on Saturday. And we have a special Easter family service, which Kevin, tell us a little bit about that. Hey, it's going to be a great night for us to gather together about 4.30 in this place. And we're going to have a service that's really geared towards families worshiping together. A, a service geared towards kids and being loud and being celebratory as we celebrate that great news that we believe in a God who's not dead, but a God who's alive. And so it's really geared towards kids and families worshiping and spending that time together here. And then immediately after that is the spring fling. So we've got food and games and all kinds of things out in the parking lot for the kids. So bring your kids, bring your grandkids next Saturday for that. Then on Sunday, we've got uh, the normal Easter uh, setup. We've got the 6.30 service in the morning. <laughs> Looking forward to that. <laughs> then we got our regular lineup. So 6.30 is, uh, is in the traditional down in the South Building. 8 o'clock and 11.30 will be traditional in the South Building. And then 9 and 10.30 is normal. We'll be here uh, in the worship center. And then right after Easter, that Wednesday, Pastor Kevin's starting a new class. Yeah, we're starting a new class that we're really hoping that at one time in your journey here at Risen Savior, everyone would come and be a part of it. And everyone includes everyone. And so that, that means you. Uh, and it's a class called His Story, Our Story. It's all about how do we help see God's fingerprints as a part of our story and how our story sp specifically fits into God's greater story. And then how can we equip and encourage you that if someone were to say, well, why are you a follower of Jesus? Why, why do you go to church? That you'd be prepared and ready and emboldened to be able to share your story with someone else. It's five weeks. Uh, it's going to be at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. Would love to have you come and be a part of that. Sign ups online or you can call the church office. Would really love to have all of you come and be a part of that experience together with us. And if that's not enough, the Saturday after Easter, we're having something called Festival. Festival, and that's in support of our youth. So if you've been here for November Fest, think that, just festival. So November Fest, we have beer and brats. Festival, we have tacos and tequila. Is this a great church or what? <laughs> Honestly, this is a great church. So a lot of fun. Come out and support the youth. And I got one final and save the best for last. And that is the voters met last week. They gave a resounding approval for all the improvements down in the South Building. That's going to start on May 1. And today we have pledged over $2.2 million. So it's all paid for. We're not done. There's two sections to that, that campaign. One was to pay for all the renovations. The other was to reduce our debt by, by $2 million. And to help move us along with that, some faithful members here at Risen Savior have stepped up, and they're going to match dollar for dollar any new pledge up to $1 million. Up to $1 million. So if any new pledges come in, or if God moves your heart and you say, hey, I want to be a part of that, and you want to increase your pledge, any increase to a pledge will be matched dollar for dollar. So let's finish this out. Let's take care of the South Building, but also take care of our, our long-term health as far as reducing our debt by a couple million. With that, let's stand up. Let's praise God. Well, the word Hosanna it literally means save us. And 2,000 years ago, people lined the streets of Jerusalem to welcome Jesus in, waving palm branches and shouting, Hosanna, Lord, save us. So we're gonna begin our worship in a very similar way, singing this song. And when we get to that first chorus and shout out Hosanna, I encourage you to wave your palm branches as we worship our God together.
strength to face the day And in your presence all our fears are washed away Cause when we see
yes I will Please be seated it's fitting that today we, we lift up songs of praise as they did so many years ago in Jerusalem as Jesus came in as, as the promised one, as the long-awaited one, but you know that it doesn't stay that way. And for us to really appreciate next week's celebration, we've got to travel with Jesus this week. We've got to go to Thursday as we see Jesus give an example for all as he washes the feet of the disciples, even the one who would betray him. will be there when he's arrested, he's mocked and beaten, a sham trial. On Friday, we'll gather around. We'll see the Son of God up on the cross, making the ultimate payment for our sins and for our salvation. It's only fitting, it's only proper that we would take a moment now and realize we're part of the reason he went to the cross. It's our own shortcomings, our own faults, our own sins. So let's, let's go before God and acknowledge that and come clean with him. I'll give you a moment right now to do that. You know, even as Jesus entered in Jerusalem, surrounded by the crowds, in reality, he was alone. Later that night, in the early hours of Friday, literally all of the disciples would abandon him and he would be alone. And then alone he went to the cross because only he could pay the price. And when he breathed his last, the payment was made made for all of your sins and, and all of mine so that we can come back on Sunday. And when he comes triumphant from the grave, his victory is, is our victory. But it's in Jesus, Jesus alone. So in Christ, Christ alone, you have been forgiven and set free. Amen.
going to remain standing as we speak together the words of our Christian faith that's found in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, Son, our Lord who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. The first reading today comes from Hebrews chapter 12, starting at verse 28. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. This is the word of the Lord. Be our gospel reading today comes from John chapter 12, starting at verse 19. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. This is the word of the Lord. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna. Save us, Lord, we pray, Hosanna. Blessed is the coming kingdom of David, Hosanna. It started with a whisper that quickly became a roar that reverberated through the crowd. The hope for the future and for now was real. They could taste it. They could feel it in their bones. They could see it in the one riding on the donkey. And yet they couldn't help but think in that moment about all the kings and the kingdoms that had come before. How could they forget Egypt and Pharaoh? Then there was the Philistines and their champion, the giant Goliath. Then there were the big bad Babylonians who came to town, bringing with them devastation and destruction and leading them off into exile. Then there were the tricky days of the Assyrians, only to be diverting disaster through Queen Esther. And then there were the Greeks. And the Greeks were different, for they brought with them not only their might and their military, their great strength and their power, but they brought with them their culture and their language and their food and their gods. And they had one goal in mind. We want to make everyone Greek. Because who wouldn't want to be Greek like us? And then there were the Romans. And if we look at history, one thing remains clear. Kingdoms come and go. Kings come and go. Dynasties rise and fall. They're finite. There's a the beginning and an end. 
And as they gathered there on that first Palm Sunday, as Jesus was riding on a donkey, as the, the palm branches were being waved in the air, as Hosanna was being shouted, as coats were being taken off to create a path for Jesus, everyone wondered, could Jesus be the guy? Could he be the one that they're waiting for? They heard the stories. He seems legit. He can make the blind see and the lame walk. He just raised a guy back from the dead because who does that? He was able to feed the masses with almost nothing. And they couldn't help but wonder, could this be the guy that they had been longing for for so long? Rome's tyranny had to end at some point. Someone had to drive them out and restore order. Could this be the one that Isaiah and Jeremiah had promised? Could this be the next David? Could this be the king that they were longing for? For that first Palm Sunday was a day full of hope and worship and celebration. Why? The king has come. And yet here's the question that I want us to grapple with together this morning. What kind of king were they looking for on that first Palm Sunday so long ago? What kind of king do you come here looking for on this Palm Sunday? We'll get to that question in a minute. But first, let's go back. What kind of king were the Hosanna shouting, palm branch waving, coat stripping crowds after as they gathered to get a glimpse of Jesus? For you see, they had gathered from all over the world, descending upon Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, to celebrate and worship the God who was mighty to save. And how long ago he had stepped into time, stepped into history, stepped into Egypt to bring deliverance from slavery. And as they descended upon Jerusalem, all the buzz was about this guy named Jesus. And the night before there had been a huge party out in the suburb of Bethany. After all, what do you do when a guy who was dead, and I'm not talking kind of, sort of dead, we're talking dead, dead, a guy who already stinketh, just ask his sister, she'll tell you, has been raised back to life again. What do you do? You party, of course. And so everyone had gone out to be a part of this party to celebrate the guy who was dead, who's now alive, and celebrate the guy who made it happen. And word traveled through the city like wildfire of this lame healing, masses feeding, dead raising, truth preaching kind of guy by the name of Jesus. And as word spread and that he was coming to town, everyone wanted to get a glimpse. Everyone wanted to see him wondering who could this be? And so today what I want to do is I want to enter back into that text, enter into John chapter 12 as we see the story of that first Palm Sunday. And as I read the story, there's one question that I want to be going through your head, and it's simply this. What kind of king were they looking for that day? What were they longing to see in Jesus? Here it goes, John 12. The next day, The large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. And so they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was they had heard he had done this sign. Now hear the words of the crowd as Luke records it in Luke chapter 19. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. What kind of king were they looking for? A king who comes in the name of the Lord, a king who was sent by God. And their thinking was this 
If this man is able to raise someone back to life from the dead, maybe, just maybe, he'll be able to drive out the Romans. He'll be able to restore order and justice and happiness. Maybe he can bring peace. And the peace that they were longing for is this shalom idea of peace. Not just to make an end to war or to end the battles. But was to restore life, restore the world, restore creation to that which it was always meant to be. To make right that which was wrong. And bring healing where there was hurt. And the longing of the hearts of the people was that Jesus would step into their lives and restore and redeem and feed and provide and protect that he would be the one they had been waiting for for so very long. What kind of God, what kind of king do you come here searching for? What are your hopes? What are your dreams? What do you want King Jesus to be? What kind of God do you come here seeking? I wonder how many of us come here today seeking a God who will do good and be a force for good in our world. How many of us come here seeking a God who will deal with evil and injustice wherever it's seen? How many of us come here searching, longing for a God who will deal with the problems that are going on in Gaza and Israel and Ukraine with terrorists and tyrants around the world? How many of us come here looking, longing for a God who will bring justice, doing away with corruption and greed and hatred? How many of us come here longing for a God who will make sure that no child or really any person for that matter will go to bed hungry tonight? How many of us come here longing today for that God who will bring that shalom idea of peace, restoring life, restoring the world, restoring creation to that which it was always meant to be? I don't know about you, but we long, I long for that kind of king. We long for that kind of God to step into our lives and step into our world. And yet I wonder if sometimes we're longing more for a firefighter or a superhero than God himself. We want someone who will swoop in and save the day, fix all of our problems, and then be out of sight and out of mind. We long for a king who will bring justice who will deal with evil, who will solve our problems, who will accomplish our agenda. But here's my question. Then what? Right off into the sunset? Fade away to let someone else take the spotlight? Is that the kind of king Jesus is? Is that the kind of kingdom that the kingdom of God is? What kind of king is Jesus? That's the question of a guy by the name of Pontius Pilate. When he gets to have his one-on-one with Jesus later on in Holy Week, he's got one question on his mind. Check it out. John chapter 18. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? What's the one question on his mind? Are you a king? And if so, what kind of a king are you? For Pilate was a man of great position, great power, great authority. And his one job in life was to be large and in charge and keep the peace. And any other king was a threat to him, threat to his power, threat to his position, threat to his livelihood, threat to his very existence. And so he looks at Jesus and says, what kind of king are you? He's not concerned. Why are the crowds so angry with you? He's going, who are you? 
What kind of kingdom are you bringing? And notice Jesus' answer. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is, to be, who is of the truth listens to my voice. Jesus' kingdom isn't like Pilate's. It's not like Pharaoh's. It's not like the Babylonians. For Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. It's not about who has the highest and greatest army, who has the most might, who has the most people, who has the most land, who has the most wealth. For the kingdom of God is different. Jesus is a different kind of king. To see this, all we have to do is look at the life of Jesus. We see the kind of king Jesus is when he makes his grand appearance. His grand entrance, not with pomp and pageantry, but in humility as he's laid in a manger. We see it in the way that he loves those whom everyone else has said aren't worthy of his attention or love. As he gives healing to those that no one else could heal. As he gives hope to everyone that has been written off. As he gives comfort and peace to those who are grieving. As he feeds thousands out of five loaves and two fishes. And the response of the crowd was, we want to make you king by force. And what does Jesus do? He slips away quietly. As he's crowned with, not with gold or jewels, but he's crowned with thorns. When the angry crowds come out to arrest him, instead of creating an army of men or an army of angels to fight him off, he's willingly betrayed by a close friend and arrested. He doesn't form an army to go out and die so that people could be killed who, are, who stood in the way of him becoming king. Instead, as king, he lays down his life and sheds his own blood so that we could be a part of his kingdom. He's the kind of king that three days later raises, is risen again from the dead, having conquered once and for all sin, death, and the devil. And if we're still asking, well, what kind of a king is this? We hear it in the words that Jesus spoke just before he ascended into heaven. He says, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Make no mistake about it. Jesus is a humble, loving, self-sacrificing king. But Jesus is also large and in charge. All authority in heaven on earth has been given to him. He is over all things. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. His kingdom has no end. I love the way that the author of Hebrews puts this. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 28. Therefore let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. What kind of a kingdom is it? It's an unshakable kingdom. For kingdoms may come and go. Kings may come and go. Princes and presidents may come and go. But the kingdom of God will remain. No matter what happens in life, no matter how much the world might feel like it's on a spin cycle, at the end of the day, Jesus is still on his throne and Jesus is still reigning. For the kingdom of God is an unshakable kingdom that transcends time, transcends place, transcends everything, even our own understanding. And so as we gather here today on the precipice of the cross and the empty tomb, we gather as a people of hope. For God is king. He is over all things. He has conquered all things. And in the cross and the empty tomb, he's made a way for us to be people of God. And a day is coming where there will be no more pain or hurt or heartache or even death. When we begin to realize what kind of king he is, we are led to worship. For we bow our knee acknowledging our complete and utter dependence upon him. For without him, we are nothing. Without him, we are lost and condemned creatures. Without him, 
we have nothing. But with him, we are forgiven. With him, we are God's people. With him, we are princes and princesses of the King of kings and Lord of lords. And so we are led to worship, acknowledging him as king, not just on Palm Sunday, but king every day. For he's king of our work lives, he's king of our home lives, he's king of our pickleball lives, he's king of our golf lives, he's king of all of our lives. And it transforms and shapes the way that we live, acknowledging that his ways are better than our ways. It leads us to love him with all of our hearts, with all of our minds, with all of our souls. For worship is far more than what happens on a Sunday morning, but transcends all of our lives. But make no mistake about it. Worship starts with God, who he is and what he's done for us. And worship leads us to celebrate, to celebrate this truth that Jesus is king. And we celebrate it not just today, but we celebrate it every time we pray those words of the Lord's Prayer. You know that magnificent ending, right? We come to the very end and we say, for thine is the, help me out, kingdom and the power and the glory just for day forever and ever what are we celebrating in those words God is king he's king of the world he's king of the universe but he's also king of our lives and his kingdom is an unshakable kingdom that has no end and for this we celebrate today and always Amen. Amen. Will you stand and pray with me? Dear Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are our king, that you've entered into time to, to not only ride a donkey, but to make a way for us to be a part of your kingdom. Lead us to worship you this day and always. Fill us with your hope that because you are king, we can know the end of the story and that we can see your work in our lives and in our world. And may we celebrate you this day and always. For you are king forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to be seated as we collect the tithes and offerings our Lord has sent with us.
me in prayer. Lord Jesus, as we begin the week of your passion, we join with the crowds in shouting Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. For you are our king, but your reign is not of this world. You reign eternal in heaven above. And we pray that you would reign in our hearts. Take us with you this week as you wash the feet of your disciples, leaving them and us an example. As you hear the voice of your betrayer, face the brutality of the cross, and finally, breathe your last in payment for our salvation. May we know the depth of your love and the cost of your sacrifice that may we return again next week to celebrate your resurrection and ours. Heavenly Father, we've been blessed to be called your children. Some among us are hurting and in need of your healing hand. We pray for David and Paul and Bonnie, for Larry and Marv and Jim, and for those that we name out loud to you now. Heal their wounds, ease their suffering, and if it is your will, restore them to health. We also ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to the lonely and the depressed, those fighting addictions, and those who are finding life too much. Give them your strength, hope, and assurance they're never alone. And Holy Spirit, you are the great comforter. We ask that you would give solace to the Emmerich family in the loss of Anita. We know that Anita is with you because of the faith she had in Jesus, but the pain of the loss is still real. Remind the family of the heavenly glory that is now a reality for her and dry their tears. And gracious God, we thank you for the countless blessings you've showered upon our congregation. As we continue with our Refresh for the Journey campaign, we give you thanks and praise for those who have joyfully committed of the portion of their resources over the next three years. And we look forward to giving all who call Risen Savior their home the opportunity to do the same. As we combine our resources, may we and the facilities you have provided for us truly be refreshed for the journey that you have in store for us ahead. All this we pray in the name of our Lord, your Son, Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. Please stand. God, watch over this week as a loving father. Walk beside you as a faithful friend and dwell in your heart as a constant companion. Amen. Our closing song today points us down the path that Jesus took from Jerusalem leading up to the cross on Mount Calvary. So let us follow Jesus to the cross this week.
serve the Lord with joy.